On August 29, 1776, General George Washington and the Continental Army were looking defeat and the end of the American Revolution squarely in the eye. They were surrounded on three sides on Brooklyn Heights by British forces after a series of disastrous defeats in the Battle of Long Island. The fourth side was the East River, and looming just a few hundred yards away in New York Harbor were hundreds of British naval vessels. Surely some of those ships would move in the next morning to force Washington's surrender. So, Washington ordered a covert nighttime escape by small boats across the East River. Aided by fog and a moonless night, they pulled off the impossible, moving 9,000 soldiers to safety on Manhattan Island right under the nose of the British. The war for American independence, which seemed all but lost, would continue. You are listening to In the Past Lane, the podcast about history and why it matters. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more... Your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. Consider that we shall be as a city upon a hill. That all men and women are created equal. Give me liberty or give me death. Nobody's free until everybody's free. The government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. History matters because it's not just about the past. History's about us, here and now. It explains the world we live in and why things are the way they are. And history gives us insights into how to achieve a more just, peaceful, and prosperous future. So people, let's do this. Hi there, everyone. Welcome to In the Past Lane, a podcast about American history and why it matters. I'm host Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, and this is In the Past Lane, episode 146, in which we take a close look at the crucial first years of the American Revolution. We are brought to you by SBI, Snoring Beagle International, and come to you this week from the Bunker Hill Studios, located in central Massachusetts. You can learn more about me, this podcast, and our guests at our website, inthepastlane.com, and on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. Leading us across the river to safety on occasion is our rebel executive producer, Lulu Spencer. So what's happening in In the Past Lane this week? Well, in one word, summer. I know it's only late May and technically still spring, but for me and my fellow professors, we just refer to the period after we file grades and graduation is in the books as summer. Or as we say around here in Massachusetts, summer. It's time to clean the office, plant the flowers and tomatoes, do a little chilling out, Cheer on the mighty Boston Bruins, who, in case you missed it, are in the Stanley Cup Finals. And then it's time to get cracking on the podcast. I've got some really great interviews lined up. And just a few days ago, I had a chance to speak with today's guest, Pulitzer Prize-winning military historian Rick Atkinson, about his new book, the first of a projected trilogy on the American Revolution. It's a fascinating conversation that I know you're going to love. Before we get to that conversation, one quick reminder. I'd really appreciate it if you'd join the growing number of In the Past Lane listeners who have become patrons of the podcast through Patreon. You can do it for as little as $1 a month, which is just 12 bucks a year, or go a little bigger if you can, say $3 or $5 a month, or like some of our listeners, $10 a month. Every penny goes to paying for things like podcast hosting and editing services, and it all adds up and it all really helps. So thanks to those of you who are helping out the podcast, and the rest of you, I hope you consider it. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on support. Thanks. Okay, people, don't shoot until you see the whites of their eyes. Your journey in the past lane begins now. Starting in the late 1990s, journalist and military historian Rick Atkinson began what turned out to be a 15-year project writing a three-volume history of the United States' effort to liberate Europe during World War II. The first volume, An Army at Dawn, The War in North Africa, 1942-1943, to 1943, appeared in 2002. It won several awards, including the Pulitzer Prize for Nonfiction. The second and third volumes were likewise hailed as masterworks of research, writing, and narrative. Having finished this trilogy in 2013, Rick Atkinson turned his attention to the American Revolution, and he's just published The British Are Coming. The War for America, Lexington to Princeton, 1775 to 1777. Not surprisingly, the early reviews have raved about Atkinson's brilliant and vivid storytelling. Here's a sample of his description of Benedict Arnold's march into the harsh Canadian wilderness during the ill-fated campaign to capture Quebec. 
Hemlock and spruce crowded the riverbanks, and autumn colors smeared the hillsides. But soon the land grew poor, with little game to be seen. Tyconic Falls was the first of four cataracts on the Kennebec, and the first of many portages that required lugging bateau, supplies and muskets, from miles over terrain ever more vertical. From sea level they would climb 1,400 feet. This place, one officer wrote as they rigged ropes and pulleys, is almost perpendicular. Sickness set in. A sad plight with the diarrhea, noted Dr. Isaac Center, the expedition surgeon, followed by the first deaths, from pneumonia, a falling tree, an errant gunshot. Rick Atkinson honed this vivid narrative style as a journalist, working for the Washington Post. He was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Journalism in 1982. He began writing books about military affairs and military history in the mid-1980s, publishing his first book in 1989, The Long Gray Line, The American Journey of West Point's Class of 1966. Since that time, he's published six more books, three of them in the aforementioned World War II trilogy. He's with me today to speak about his latest, The British Are Coming, which focuses on the first two years of the American Revolution. In the course of our conversation, Rick Atkinson explains how an inexperienced George Washington had to learn on the job how to organize, manage, and command the Continental Army. How one of George Washington's key leadership insights was his awareness that American soldiers could not simply be driven. Rather, they needed to be led. How George Washington was not only effective in the field of battle, but also in managing the politics surrounding the American revolutionary effort. How vital but unlikely figures emerged during the war, like Henry Knox, Benedict Arnold, and Nathaniel Green how the British both overestimated the percentage of colonists who remained loyal to the crown and underestimated the fighting effectiveness of the Continental Army. How the Continental Army enjoyed a lot of success in 1775, but then nearly lost the war in the summer and fall of 1776. And how George Washington's bold decision to cross the Delaware into New Jersey to surprise attack the British at Trenton and later at Princeton in late December 1776 and early January 1777 stopped British momentum, and boosted American morale at a crucial point in the war. Rick Atkinson, welcome to In the Pass Lane. Thank you, Ed. I guess I want to start with one big general question, which is that you've spent a lot of time over the years writing a prize-winning three-volume history of World War II, and at the completion of that, you obviously had a blank screen and could choose to do any project. What led you to jump back in time to the American Revolution? What drew you to this particular topic? Well, in 2013, as I was finishing volume three of the Liberation Trilogy about the American role in the liberation of Europe in World War II, and I was thinking of what to do next, and the obvious thing would have been to pivot to the Pacific and right. do for that theater what I'd done for the Mediterranean and Western Europe. And it just didn't have any appeal to me, partly because I would have had to start the war over again at Pearl mm -hmm. Harbor or even earlier than that. And my eye was just drawn, as it's been drawn since I was a kid, to our origin story and back to the revolution to learn more about who we are and where we came from, what our forebears believed, what they were willing to die for, which is, I think, the most profound question any people can ask themselves. I've drawn by the characters. I've always been interested in not only the main characters who are inescapable, the George Washingtons, the Ben Franklins, and so on, but particularly on the British side. So I spent at least as much time trying to understand the British point of view from uh, George III on down mm -hmm. as I did with the Americans who were involved. And that comes through very clearly in the book that you're, you're looking at both sides of this emerging and eventually escalating conflict. And you have to make a key decision in the first part of the book, which is to speedily t bring everybody up to speed on the events leading up to the beginning of the war yeah. in 1775 and do that very deftly. And then we begin chapter one in the spring of 1775 in Massachusetts. And it's there, of course, that the first major clash of the war takes place, the Battle of Lexington and Concord. That's April mm -hmm. 19th, 1775, not far from where I'm sitting right now. Yeah. And then that's followed uh, in turn by the Battle of Bunker Hill in June. And then George Washington arrives in Boston not long after that to take command of the Continental Army. And as you point out, he is decidedly unimpressed with what he sees when he looks at this <laughs> ragtag army. And he knows he's got you know a lot of work ahead of him and a lot of learning about how to do this, you know, monumental job. Tell our listeners about the challenges that Washington faces in this beginning of his command and, and how he evolves to meet them. Well, you're quite right. He shows up on July 2nd, 1775. He's a Virginian, and he's been given command of the New Continental Army, which is almost entirely composed of New Englanders. Uh, it's partly a, an act of faith by the Congress that 
he will help to unify the disparate colonies, which, of course, think of themselves almost as separate countries at the time. Right. He has five years of experience in uniform as a Virginia militia colonel, but he's been out of uniform for 16 years. Uh, He had kind of a checkered career uh, while he was in uniform. Uh, He was present at the defeat and death of his commander, General Braddock, British commander, killed near uh, current day Pittsburgh. He arrives and he recognizes that there's a lot he doesn't know. He doesn't know about artillery. He doesn't know about cavalry. He doesn't know about running a continental army, much less the logistical aspects of that. And he is, in fact, decidedly unimpressed with the soldiers that he sees. He writes about the dirty New Englanders. He's very disparaging, <laughs> not only of the yeah. rank and file, but of, of the junior officers that he encounters. There is a learning uh, curve that's required of Washington, not only in understanding better how to command a force of this size and a theater of this scale, but there's a mystical bond between leader and led that he doesn't quite get initially. He has left Mount Vernon in the care of a couple hundred slaves and overseers, and they're going to take care of his business while he's away. And he does not really understand what the men who have left their farms and their shops and their families to serve or decide what they have sacrificed. And I think that uh, one of the things that we see through the early year and a half or so of the war is Washington forging this relationship with his troops. Uh, He has to know what it is that they are giving up in order to be part of his army, and they have to know that he knows. It's a reciprocal bond that's being forged. And then he's he's got a lot of other things to learn about quartermaster duties. He has virtually no staff. He is his own staff. Right. So he's his own intelligence officer. He's his own clothier general trying to figure out how to provide uniforms for them. It's an enormous task ahead of him. Uh, fortunately for us, he's up to the task. He's, among other things, he's very robust. He's physically impressive. He's almost 6'2", which is gigantic in that day and age. Jefferson describes him as the greatest horseman of his age. He's magnificent on a horse. Mm-hmm. And for eight years, it seems like he, he never even has a cold. He just is indestructible. He doesn't get sick. He doesn't get shot, despite being in harm's way a number of times. So we see him come onto the stage. You know, he does a lot of grumbling privately. The man who's sort of embalmed in reverence uh, historically really does a lot of kvetching. And he talks about how put upon he is and how if he had known what he was getting himself into, he never would have taken on this task. And he's he's, he's a real grumbler (laughs) privately. But this is part and parcel of the growing pains that the American army, which arguably is the critical component in forging what will be a new republic. And he's the indispensable man in this indispensable institution. It's a fascinating thing to watch because it's really, it really is part of the creation story. Right. And we've seen this in other, whether it's business or sports, where somebody comes in to uh, find a, you know, a ragtag team and it can go really, really badly if they bring in a heavy hand and decide that yeah. this outfit really needs is an iron fist. Yep. And Washington is, you know, com- seems to have that capacity to combine serious, you know, adherence to order and demanding dignity and people behaving properly and carrying out orders, but also, as you say, that ability to kind of bring people along, which would not have necessarily been expected of a Virginia gentleman. He discovers that, as he puts it in so many words, he needs to lead the army, not to drive it like a taskmaster. That's right. He he says in January of 77 that if people who are not used to being ordered around will not be drove, they must be led. He's a leader, and that, that's the essence of his uh, success. You know, I spent 15 years with Dwight Eisenhower in writing about World War II, and the two of them remind me a lot of each other in Mm -hmm. certain ways. For one thing, they're not particularly gifted battlefield generals. They don't see a battlefield spatially and temporally the way a great captain like Napoleon does. And we see Washington make a lot of mistakes. Eisenhower made a lot of mistakes in early theater command in the Mediterranean and in Western Europe. But Together, I think both have uh, larger attributes that allow them to rise above whatever deficiencies they've got as battlefield commanders. Among other things, they're both political generals without equal in American history. Tell us a little bit more about that, because there's there's several dimensions to that term. 
Tell us what that means. Yeah, I think it's an interesting aspect of success for both the Washington and Eisenhower. It doesn't mean partisan politics, obviously. There are no Democrats and Republicans in 1775. But he's political, Washington is, in the sense that, first of all, he acknowledges repeatedly and affirms repeatedly civilian control of the military. That's right. He acquiesces to that concept right from the get-go. And a good portion of his correspondence from the moment he arrives in Cambridge in the summer of 1775 is to Congress and is acknowledging the fact that they are his political masters. This is a fraught subject in the 18th century. They're very aware of what Cromwell had done in in England. They're very aware of the dangers of of a junta, of a man on horseback. And then he's political in the sense that he knows how to get things done. He knows how to, a lot of his correspondence is to colonial governors, state governors after the middle of 1776, in which he, first of all, shows deference to them. He acknowledges Mm -hmm. their role in what's, uh, what's transpiring in the revolution, but he's good at negotiating for what it is that he needs, what it is that he wants, what it is that he can provide for them in terms of security and so on. And I think he's got a natural instinct at it. He has a brain organized for executive action. He has a very good memory. He's uh, clear and precise in his writing and in his speaking. He rarely go away without knowing precisely what it is that the boss wants. And he's got a, a penchant for uh, making decisions. He's, you know, rarely indecisive sometimes, but, you know, Generally, he'll make a decision and stick to it, and he has a good eye for subordinate talent. Right. These are traits that he shares with Eisenhower, incidentally. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's part of the package that we get. It's very interesting to see that comparison with Eisenhower, especially that point about surrounding himself with good people. And uh, Washington also was well known for consulting with his officers and really lis- truly listening to them when it came to forming their next steps, which not only gave him access to good ideas, but also earned the loyalty of that officer corps. Well, that's true. Of course, it's not universal. There are cabals. There are those who think that uh, he should be replaced. There are those who think that they, like Gates, for example, one of his senior generals who had been a British Army officer, thinks that Gates perhaps could replace him. Mm -hmm. Lee, another former British Army officer, is really plotting against him in late 1776 and is uh, stupid enough to get himself captured. So he's removed from the predicament. But you know, it's it's not a given that Washington would survey the officers that he sees when he shows up uh, outside of Boston in 1775 and sees a 25-year-old overweight Boston bookseller named Henry Knox. That's right. And recognizes that this guy, who's not even really a part of the army yet, he's there as a volunteer, this guy has uh, studied gunnery and studied engineering in a rudimentary sense and is skilled enough and capable of growth enough that he's going to be the father of American artillery. Mm -hmm. And he's going to be such an exemplary officer that someday he'll be Secretary of War. Same thing with Nathaniel Green. Shows up basically as a, you know, he's a Quaker anchor smith from Rhode Island, and he has no substantive military experience. He's one of the great generals in our national history. Washington sees that he is a man of parts, that he's going to grow into the job. He's going to make some serious mistakes along the way. But nevertheless, he's got character. He's got command presence. He's got a natural knack for leading. And the third guy I would mention is Benedict Arnold. Mm -hmm. Washington recognizes that this merchant from Connecticut, who's uh, ornery and complicated and difficult at times, is born to lead other men in the dark of night. There's a lot of people who don't like him. Subordinates are constantly yapping at Arnold's heels. And yet uh, Washington recognizes that he's one of the finest officers in his army. And he's probably in the first two years of the war, the best combat leader on either side. Right. Adding to the tragedy of Benedict Arnold that he, he would go down in history as one of the greats. And yet we only remember him as one of the turncoats. So true. Well, so we talked a lot about Washington having to learn a lot and doing so, but also the British at this point in this early part of the war, this first year, are also confronting a lot of unforeseen challenges. I mean, for one thing that you note, they they overestimate how much loyalism and how many people in America are loyal to the crown, and that shapes their policies. They also underestimate the Continental Army and what it can do. Tell us more about the British learning curve. 
Yeah, Ed, I think they make several strategic miscalculations, and one of them you put your finger on. They believe that uh, loyalty and loyalism to the crown in the colonies runs deeper and wider than it actually does. They believe that there is a silent majority of those who really want the crown to crack down on this insurrection and uh, will rally to the king and the king's forces when given the opportunity. And, you know, contemporary scholars estimate that loyalty was much less of a factor, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 18 to 20 percent of the two million white Americans in America were loyal. Mm -hmm. Now, loyalty is a shifting concept. You're more loyal when the British army is in your backyard than you might be after they leave and your rebel neighbors are coming to lean on you. So that's a problem for them and for the British. And they continue to overestimate the extent to which there is this residual loyalty to the crown that will help them to suppress the insurrection. You know, the king also, and we're talking about George here, and his ministers make a strategic miscalculation about what's at stake. And that's one of the reasons why they are willing to wage war for eight years across 3,000 miles of open ocean in the age of sail. And that is they believe that if the colonies are permitted to slip away, if the Americans are permitted to essentially withdraw from the empire, that then there will be insurrections in Ireland and Canada and the Sugar Islands Mm -hmm. in the West Indies and India. And that the newly created British Empire, which really has only come into existence since 1763 with British victory in the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War as we know it, that that empire will dissolve, that that's the real the end of Britain as a world power. And you see this in the correspondence, you see it in the king's sort of meditations on what it is he thinks that he's doing and being a hardliner on this. And it's quite wrong. It's not illogical that they think in these terms, but you know, it's not going to lead to the collapse of the British Empire. There were other vicissitudes that they go through, and they've got, obviously, war against Napoleon ahead of them. Mm. But, you know, the empire will will grow even greater in the 19th century. So, you know, these kinds of strategic misapprehensions are what get countries into trouble. I mean, that theory that I just described is a version of the domino theory that led us into Vietnam. Yes, that's what came to mind, an early version of it. Well, one of the things that I found really fascinating was you you highlight a couple of British blunders that are strategic blunders or political strategic blunders that are predicated on this idea of loyalty and this desperate need to keep the Americans in the fold. And they are the burning of Falmouth, uh, Massachusetts yes. and Norfolk, Virginia. Tell us briefly about how those two incidents you know, militarily made sense and in some respects, but sent the wrong message to the Americans and in some ways galvanized revolutionary spirit. Yeah, I think that's exactly what happened. Falmouth is in what is today Maine. Maine was part of Massachusetts then. And the British sent a a small squadron out to teach the uh, rebels a lesson. Falmouth had offended the crown in various ways. And uh, an ultimatum was issued uh, to the people of Falmouth. This is a little village in the middle of nowhere on the Maine coast to basically surrender all of their firearms. And uh, after much gnashing of teeth and agony, the folks in Falmouth said, no, we're not going to do that. And the British bombarded the town and then sent Marines ashore and set fire to it. And they they burned the town to the ground. Mm. There was outrage throughout the colonies. And then this is repeated. First of all, they'd already burned the town of Charlestown right across the Charles River from Boston. Mm -hmm. They burned that down during the Battle of Bunker Hill as a punitive measure. And then Norfolk, there was Lord Dunmore, who was the royal governor in Norfolk. There was a little battle fought outside of Norfolk. The British uh, lost. They retreated into Norfolk. The Royal Navy came in, and again, as a punitive measure, they bombarded the town. They set fire to part of the town. There's a pretty good fire going. The Americans decide, okay, you want to burn down the town? We'll burn down the whole town. They set fire to the rest of it. Norfolk was reduced to ashes. It was the largest town in Virginia at the time. Mm. Most of the of the damage was done by the rebels, and of course, they blamed it on the British. They blamed it on the British for yep. for decades. But you're right. This is exactly the sort of thing that galvanized those who were fence straddlers, those who weren't sure, and enraged rebel patriots, along with other atrocities, real atrocities. The Hessians, who were German mercenaries, come in and they 
commit a lot of rapes in New Jersey in the late fall mm-hmm. of 1776. You're looking to win hearts and minds, which is a phrase that uh, General Henry Clinton, British general, had, had coined in 1776. Well, you're not going to win hearts and minds when you're waging war this way. And that's a big problem for the British. Right. Big, big problem. And will get worse as time goes by. So one thing that seems to me, if we look at the first two years of the war, which is what this first volume of your trilogy focuses on, you know, if you step back and look at from March of 1775 to March of 1776, the Continentals and George Washington enjoy a pretty good amount of success. Um, Some of them are small skirmishes, but they do seem to be coming together together. And it it culminates in March of 1776 with Washington's army forcing the British to evacuate Boston. But then things shift rather dramatically, particularly by the middle of the summer. And the British send a massive invasion to the next scene of action, which is New York. And what unfolds in July and then really begins in August and September of 1776 is the Battle of Long Island, sometimes also called the Battle of New York. What goes wrong for George Washington and the Continental Army in New York? And how close do they come to literally the whole game being over? Well, that's a very good summary. What happens? Yeah, the Americans shift uh, after the British evacuate Boston in the middle of March. They shift to New York. That's going to be the next battlefield. New York is a small town, then about 20,000 people on the tip of Manhattan Island. The British send not only the force that has been in Boston earlier, but reinforcements from Britain, along with a very substantial portion of the Royal Navy. It's the largest overseas expedition that Britain has ever mounted. There are about 30,000 basically gathering, mustering around Staten Island. They land in August of 1776 on the western tip of Long Island. Washington, again, shows his shortcomings as a battlefield commander. He misreads the terrain. He doesn't recognize how vulnerable his lines are near the little village of Brooklyn. The British General Howe, the field commander, General William Howe, with his brother, Richard Howe, who's the admiral in charge of the Royal Navy, they launch a very deft attack. It's quite well done. They outflank the American left flank, get behind the Americans. The American, it's a rout. And it's the biggest battle of the revolution. And uh, Washington is pinned up against the East River, makes the correct decision that he's going to evacuate Long Island to Manhattan Island very adroitly organizes a little flotilla. It's kind of like Dunkirk. Mm -hmm. And in the night, they slip away and a very providential fog comes in to obscure the fact that they are leaving, that they're decamping, that this evacuation is going away. And they get away, you know, it's a chin whisker within having Mm -hmm. his army obliterated. The British in the morning, they recognize that they slipped away and they will eventually push them out of New York completely but Washington has lived to fight another day after this terrible drubbing on Long Island. So, you know, you're right. They've taken a nasty turn, and it's up to uh, Washington now to figure out what to do. Now that this enormous British force, by 18th century North American standards, is in place, how is he going to fight them? What's his, his strategy going to be at this point? And that's where we'll go for the rest of 1776. Right. So it's a series of losses and Washington just sort of continuously retreating from New York into New Jersey. And right up to the very end of 1776, it really looks pretty grim. Those were the times that try try men's souls, if ever there were. And then Washington does something pretty extraordinary in late December 1776 and into early January 1777 in New Jersey. And that's where your book ends. So maybe you could tell us in short order what it is that Washington does and why it is pretty extraordinary and why it works. Well, he's desperate, and his army is down to about 3,000 men, and they've fled across New Jersey and across the Delaware into Pennsylvania. He writes to his brother at one point that the game is pretty near over. He really is despondent at this point. Mm. And he writes to Congress, he says, desperate times require desperate measures, and he comes up with a desperate plan, which is to recross the Delaware River back into New Jersey and to attack the Hessian, the German garrison at Trenton, which is somewhat isolated in Washington's good intelligence. He does this, you know, proverbially no plan survives contact with the enemy, and this plan doesn't survive contact with ice in the Delaware River, so that Mm -hmm. two of his three forces in this attack never get across the river because of the ice, but the force that's under him personally gets across. They surprise the Hessian garrison early in the morning of uh, December 26, 1776. The Hessians, incidentally, are not, as mythology would hold it, drunk. The commander's not drunk. 
they're surprised though, and and Washington mm-hmm. routes the garrison, uh, captures or kills most of them, and then he doubles down. Instead of just collecting his winnings, he goes back into Pennsylvania and then crosses the Delaware again, gulls the British into attacking him at Trenton. He inflicts heavy casualties on them, and then in the night. He slips, he's making this up as he goes along, incidentally. Yeah. He slips around the British left flank and attacks and destroys the British rear garrison at Princeton in early January 1777. It's about as deft as it gets in uh, 18th century warfare. He's shown that he can be a very accomplished uh, battlefield general. And then he takes his army into the, the high ground in North Jersey where they'll be safe for the winter and they're able to kind of put themselves back together and to rest and to refit and wait till the spring when the fighting season starts again. Right. And the importance of ending on, you know, to use modern terminology, ending on a winning streak is really important because this is a story of war and battles and, you know, flanking maneuvers and such. But it's also a story of politics and how, to what extent Washington has the, the American people on his side and the commitment of his soldiers. And so by Writing the the ship, as it were, from such dire circumstances to pull out these victories was they militarily aren't gigantic, but they are enormous in terms of the the overall course of the war. That's just right, and I think it's probably even more important that he gives heart to a, a people that have been really despondent. Not only Washington saying the game is nearly up, people in general thought that, and it really revives flagging spirits overnight. People, again, feel sort of committed to, to the war and feel, okay, maybe we got a fight and chance here, and, and now we have an opportunity, and we show those redcoats that we really can fight, that they have been underestimating us. And it's important for Congress. It's important for state governors. It's important particularly for his army. They walk out, and they're, they're strutting a bit as they're reaching North Jersey in January of 77 feeling that, uh, you know, we went toe-to-toe with one of the finest armies the world has seen in the 18th century, and uh, we tattooed them pretty good. And I think that that's really important. And this is one of the things that helps to build that mystical bond between leader and led. And there's nothing like winning occasionally to make you feel like you're on the same team and that you're you're, uh, pulling in the same direction. And, Mm -hmm. And that's what comes out of this period at the end of 1776. And in some ways, it also has an impact on the British, too, because they have to correspondingly take the Continentals and Washington more seriously and, you know, commit more troops to certain areas and set up more surveillance and so forth in order to counter what they now see as a real enemy. That's true. And it also has an impact on the political scene back in Britain. There's a substantial minority of people in Parliament and also just British citizens who are sympathetic to the rebels for various reasons. And the reverses that the British suffer in in late 76, 77, early 77, first of all, it makes the king and his ministers recognize that they're in for the long haul now. The war is not going to be quick and it's not going to be over soon, that the resources are going to be needed, that it's going to cost a lot more money, that they're going to need more troops, they're going to need more ships. And it adds to the controversy within parliament and within the body politic in Britain about whether there's any wisdom in prosecuting this war. You know, they're going to stick with it for a long time. There are going to be a lot of reverses for the Americans to come. Again, Washington is going to nearly lose the war by a chin whisker in subsequent battles. But nevertheless, you know, we see that the dynamic has changed pretty substantially by the time the winter of 77 sets in. And so by way of conclusion, when is your next volume coming out and what can we expect in that next segment of the trilogy? Well, I've started working on volume two. I haven't done any archival work to speak of yet, so I've got a long way to go. It's going to be several years at least to get it done. It took me 15 years to do the three World War II volumes, and I don't have any illusions. I'm older and slower now than I was then. <laughs> I don't have any illusions that this is going to be a whole lot quicker. I think, you know, what we're going to see in the next volume is some pretty key moments. The Battle of Saratoga, yes. the French come into the war, becomes, as you know, Ed, a global war, really. Right. It becomes a an international war. It's not just an insurrection on the edge of the world anymore. And I think I'm going to end it probably with the Battle of uh, Charleston in the spring of 1780. It's mm-hmm. a terrible defeat for the Americans. 5,000 men uh, uh, captured at Charleston. It looks as though, again, the worm has turned, that British hopes are on the rise, and things look dark for the Americans. So it's a substantial next act, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting after it. 
All right. Well, we are looking forward to it. Your book first volume is excellent and really an amazing read. So Rick Atkinson, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us at In the Past Lane. I'm really pleased to be with you. Thanks for having me, Ed. Rick Atkinson is the author of The British Are Coming, The Battle for America, Lexington to Princeton, 1775 to 1777. Published by Henry Holton Company and available wherever books are sold. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to show your love for the podcast, you can buy some of our merchandise. Just go to inthepastlane.com and click on Merchandise. There you'll see more than 50 t-shirts with In the Past Lane logos, not to mention a whole line of shirts with history quotes from notable people like Abraham Lincoln, who once said, Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. And Mark Twain, who said, History does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And remember, everything you see at our merchandise page comes as a hoodie, water bottle, coffee mug, stickers, you name it. So check it all out at inthepastlane.com. Thanks. Okay, people, that's all for this episode of In the Past Lane. Thank you so much for tuning in. For more information about the many things we talked about today, head over to our show page for this episode at inthepastlane.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to this podcast at Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify, or wherever you access your podcasts. I'm In the Past Lane's host, Edward T. O'Donnell, your historian at large, reminding you that history explains our world. So let's pay attention to it. Thanks for listening. We hope you'll join us next time for another journey in the past lane. Hey, Lulu, people want to know where they can find you on social media. At Girl Hates History. SBI, Snoring Beagle International.